I don't think that I have ever met a stronger lady going through some of the things she went through a few years ago and is still going through. We would go and visit a, a, a hospital a couple times and, you know, on the way there trying to figure out what can we say to encourage this family in this situation. And she would come bopping out of the room encouraging us in some way, shape, or form. And, and going by the house at times and, you know, seeing Corey and, you know, the, the first sight of him and the weight that he had lost was jarring and shocking. And just the encouragement that we always got from you, even though we were supposed to be the ones encouraging you, I just have never met anyone stronger uh, going through that type of thing. So I just thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're today. welcome. And, and, it's, all yours. and it's not me, it's God above. If God wasn't in our lives, I wouldn't be able to do this today for you. Okay? This is what chapel is about. For two years, I heard about chapel. Every time Corey would have chapel, Mom, CCC doesn't compare to chapel. It's slow, the music is slow. So now I got to experience. So I thank you again and thank you for all the green that you're wearing in support of Corey and just the support of us in the last two years. And I hope that someone in this room today, when you hear Corey's story, if you're going through some struggles, I want you to remember never give up. Corey got the victory. Even though Corey is not here on earth with us today, he's in God with our Heavenly Father. Can you imagine the things that he's experiencing? I can't, I can't wrap my human brain around it. I'm jealous. I really am jealous. Corey had such a positive attitude through that whole seven months, and it came at such a time where he was getting independence from my husband Dale and I. Pretty soon he was going to be driving a car. But bye, bye, Mom and Dad, I'm out of here. Can I borrow the keys? He was looking forward to that. He got his lifeguard license. He had it all set up. He was going to follow my footsteps. I had worked for many years at Port Shiloh Pool at the Zion Park District and served many, many people in that community. He just loved doing that, teaching kids how to swim lessons and how to dive off the diving boards. And Corey wanted to share in that. So he went through the lifeguarding process. He was a certified lifeguard. Looking forward to the following summer. Everything was going good for him. He was getting acquainted here with God, good friends. Too many to mention. And I don't want to leave anybody out, so I'm not going to say that, but just all of you just really supported him. Especially being the new kid on the block. A lot of you have come to Christian Life School since kindergarten through eighth grade, so here comes this new kid, freshman. He didn't know, you know too many people, but you embraced him and you helped him through a lot of different things. Now, here's what happened. Right after Christmas, we had a good break. He was staying up late, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't really care who was break, you know, so what. Then he went back to school, decided to come home on that, it was that Friday, January 3rd, and he said to me, he goes, Mom, I, I got cried again in chapel. I go, why'd you cry in chapel? I don't, I don't know. I says, well, what song was it? He says, forever ready. So I looked it up, and I thought, hmm, I'm into his arms. Hmm. He lost his grandmother about seven years ago. I thought maybe there, you know, was some type of connection there. Well, he decided to go to his buddy's house, Jake Cress. He lived in the harbor, good buddy since kindergarten. They went on a hike, six miles. Felt pretty good, because Corey's good and fit. He liked to free run, he liked to lift weights. He's doing that, uh, P90X, he was really getting into that. And I was really proud of him being a PE teacher. God, my son's following my footsteps. He's going to be healthy for the rest of his life. Little did I know that following Sunday, he came down with flu-like symptoms. Okay, it's just a flu. I stayed home with him for three days from school. Because how do you feel, Gordon? Well, I just feel kind of odd. It's okay. Why don't we go see Dr. Engstrom at the Zion Clinic on Lewis Avenue in Zion? So Dr. Engstrom took a look at him and said, yeah, he's got the flu, we'll give him some antibiotics and just kind of boost his immune system a little bit and we'll get him on, on track again, it's okay. So we gave him the antibiotic and Thursday, Friday, my husband decided to stay home from work and stay with him so I wouldn't miss a whole week of, you know, being at school. We decided, he called me up and he said, should I even take him back for a checkup because he's feeling pretty good. I said, yeah, let's still follow through. 
okay. A couple days later, I watched my son's skin go from a nice pink to a gray. And then his teeth would chatter. Took his temperature, it was 104. Hmm. Called up Doc Ingstrom, told him what I had witnessed. And he was talking kind of silly, like goofy things. Like he thought he was a Waukegan and sent him to Park. Well, being a PE teacher, I know that has to do with blood pressure because if you don't get enough blood up to your brain sometimes, your brain does some goofy things. Well, this was what happened. So I took him back in, and Doc said, let's take him up to uh, Aurora. Happens to be right you know, behind your place. Took some scans, took some x-rays, took some blood work. Didn't like what they saw. Something else was going on, let's check him in at Aurora. So as we checked him into Aurora, six days of watching him chatter, then spike to fever 105, then chatter, turn gray. They took all kinds of tests. I mean, he must have been tested, I don't know how many times. They still didn't know what was going on. For two weeks, boys and girls, we did not know what was going on. In this day and age, we did not know what was going on. Finally, about the sixth day, after he was put on all this IV, he gained 30 pounds. So he went from 160 to 190 pounds in six days, just because of all the IVs that they were putting him in and stuff. And so we decided, you know, this isn't working, something's going on. And then all of a sudden he complained about breathing problems. They took another scan. Well, they found that he was getting pleural infusion, they call it, where water starts to develop underneath both lungs. So they decided to take him into the emergency room, and they took a needle, no lie, and I'm watching all this. They bent him over, and they took that needle into his back, and then drew out 600 cc's of liquid. Corey was like, ah, oh, you finally breathe. Thanks, guys. That's what he said. I mean, thanks, guys. He had such a great attitude during this whole thing. So, he felt so much better, but in my heart, and in my husband's heart, we knew we had to get him up to Children's because they still didn't know what was going on. Well, they decided to take a, a lymph node right underneath his clavicle. And we didn't know the results of that until five days after we took him to Children's that in fact, indeed, it was T-cell lymphoma. T-cell lymphoma, how does a 15-year-old boy get T-cell lymphoma? Oh, we can't tell you that. Was it something that triggered it? Was it something that he ate? Was it something that we did? He goes, it's nobody's fault. It's just the cards that I dealt to your son. Well, right away, I dig my heels in. I'm going to fight it. Got with my husband. I said, we can beat this. So we go back in. Corey says, well, what do I have? He says, Corey, you got cancer. They call it T-cell lymphoma. T-cell lymphoma, what is that? I said, it has to do with your blood. Your white blood cells, you don't have an immune system, honey. Your white blood cells aren't working right, and they can attack viruses and infections and stuff. He kind of looked at us and he said, I got cancer, huh? Well, I'm going to kick its beep. <laughs> I can't use that word today. And I said, of course, that's the attitude that we need because we don't know what we're facing. So, after that initial shock, and doctors coming in and out of our room. My goodness, there must have been 25 doctors. Corey was rolling his eyes. He says, who's this guy? He said, this guy's here to take blood. Another guy would come in and say, who's this guy? Well, this one's been going to do this looking at your lungs. He says, my guy, you got an army? I said, yeah, I do. And I said, not only do you have an army down here, you have an army above. Don't forget, mama won't. won't. So we were talking about well, a couple days later, after they got the initial blood work and everything, they decided that they got to put in a port. And a port is a gizmo that they put underneath your skin, that a line goes directly to your heart, so that when the chemo is given to you, it just goes right into your main bloodstream, with the possibility of doing something to your heart. Let's just get the chemo in there. That was our, let's get, you know, get going and battle this thing. So we went into the, um, they had to do a bone aspirate, so they go into your hip, and they see how many cancer cells are in, your, in the bone marrow itself. 
And then they did a spinal tap on him to see how many cancer cells are in his spine, spinal fluid. So my husband and I were in the waiting room, and they told us it would take about an hour, an hour and ten minutes or so. Well, an hour passes, and we get, finally get a call, and they said, well, they only got about 20 minutes left. We should be out in about 20 minutes. You know that little nice little call where everybody's in the waiting room? 20 minutes passed. 40 minutes passed. I'm starting to get a little nervous, so I go down in the chapel, ready to prayer up again. Finally, my husband and I are sitting there. We turn and look. This woman is talking and talking and listening and talking and listening at that desk and listening. Oh my gosh, who is that? Telling me he's always got a whole show that isn't for us. Talking and listening, talking, talking, listening. Finally, she stands up and she says, appearance of Corey Bats, please. Grab Dale's hand and go in and they shuffle us off in this little big room all by ourselves. Dale goes, what does this mean? I know one thing. Last time I was shut off in a little room, my mom passed. So let's set up a prayer. We set up another prayer. Here comes the oncologist, the anesthesiologist, and good old time you know, that orchestrated everything in her seven months at Rapid Children's. Um, we got to tell you something. And I said, yeah, why don't you guys sit down? And I said, okay. Corey's blood pressure went 60 over 40, and we had to keep him tuned. So they had to keep him incubated. And we got him up in ICU. I says, what does this mean? Doc looked right at me and said, Corey will tell us what this means. Okay. So we go up there. We go to the ICU room. Corey is hooked up to life support. Every machine imaginable, he's hooked up to. Tube in his mouth, he got his eyes taped, they got the uh, they call the, God, excuse my name now, but it's the uh, line that goes directly into your vein to really watch your blood pressure. So any little hint of any little thing, they can pick it up right away. So we can't talk to him. And they got him drugged up pretty good and got him on my support the machine was breathing for him. So I get down on my knees, Dale gets on his knees and we pray. He was like that for two days. Corey showed what he thought of that. He came enough too. He got down to 130 pounds after all that, from 190, remember. He came to about 2 in the morning. He grabbed that tube and he pulled, him, pulled it out himself. <laughs> and then he says, I need a little help here. <laughs> the nurse was just like, well, she's expecting him you know, not to be responding to anything. So that was another God favor. We get there, we call up that Saturday morning. Well, he's had an interesting night, everything is fine, so, but we'll tell you when you get up here. I said, okay. So we get up there. I am talking to the nurse, and she is just filming me with all what happened. And they had to re drug him again because they were afraid because he was hooked up to that one special um, line that if it came out, you know, he could you know, you know, bleed out pretty quickly. And so they were you know, making sure that he was this and that. But we came in. And they had a V-pack on him. If you've never seen a V-pack, it's like a Darth Vader, Darth Vader's mask, except it's clear. And it's forcing air into his lungs so that his lungs stay open. We can talk to him, but only for about 30 seconds or so. So I'm standing off over here talking to the nurse. The nurse is telling me what happened the night before. And so Corey and Dale are across the room. And I'm watching and I'm listening. And then all of a sudden I see my husband's face turn completely white. He's talking to Corey. He leaves the room. What was that all about? I look at the nurse, and she's like, and everything you hear today are conversations and words that actually took place. And if you ever have any doubt in your faith, I hope today you walk away from here not having any doubt. And no man you have a heavenly father, and angels are watching you, and loved ones are watching you, because Corey said to Dale, the silly angels forgot to take my mask off. I looked at his blood pressure. It was 50 over 30. So those of you that kind of go in the medical field and kind of know about all that, that means you're kind of floating. You're kind of, you don't know whether you're staying or you're going. So I said to the nurse, she says, well, you know how fragile his life is right now, don't you? I said, yes, I do. I says, can we 
kneel down on the ground and say a prayer. She said, absolutely. So we sat down, said a prayer. Corey calls me over. He's so drugged up. He's just doing this with his arms. But he has the most angelic looking, peaceful face. He's doing this to me. I said, Corey, Mom is here. What's up? Mom, what color is the floor? He can't see the floor. When they got him, he cannot see the floor. So I look at the nurse and she went, I says, you see how there? She says, he may go. I get on my knees again. Say a quick prayer. My dad comes a day later. Corey's been like that for about a day, hovering, asking questions. <coughs> my husband hangs out of that. The silly angels forgot to take my mask off. That was proof to him right there there's a God in heaven. And if you don't have your faith in order, if you don't have your life in order, I hope today when you leave, you get it in order because you don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. A lot of teenagers think they're invincible. We are all fragile, but we're in the palm of his hand every single day. So, two days later, my boy is sitting up. He's talking. He's relating. Amazing. He was on his deathbed just two days ago, and here he is talking to me like nothing happened. Thank God. Hallelujah. I got him. I said, Corey, do you remember anything? And the nurse says, you won't he won't remember anything because anything that's going tragically like that, they give you an amnesia drug. So if that situation happens again, you don't start to panic. So Corey wouldn't have remembered anything like that. So they give him the chemo. Corey battles it for seven months. And in that seven months, we had a lot of highs, we had a lot of lows. A lot of people want to come and see Corey, but they don't understand he does not have an immune system. So if you want to come up and see him, you've got to double check who you've been in contact with. Have you been anybody with flu, a cold, a sniffle? Because that will be life-threatening to the cancer patient. They don't have an immune system. Everything is right wiped out from the chemo. So I would always say, yeah, sure, come on, but make sure you're doing this and this and this. I don't want my kid to get, you know, taken away from me because of a common cold thing, because he has no immune system. Well, during that course of that first month, when you get chemo, you develop the sores in your mouth. And to get his weight up, we came up with a device, they call it a super shake. And we would get it down to him in two and a half minutes. My husband tied him one time. It's 600 calories in there because he was really losing a lot of weight because of the chemo. Doctors were starting to get worried about him losing too much weight when he couldn't fight anymore. So we had to keep his weight up. We had that, we had that worry as well. So I get the super shake, and we would I just he'd keep his mouth open, and I would just keep shoveling in. Two and a half minutes, he was like, Whoo, I got a brain for his mom. He said, I'm just, you know, it's amazing. And I said, Corey, we've got to keep your weight up. He said, I know, Mom, no problem. What amazed me about Corey, and this is how I know that God has been with us since the first day of his diagnosis, <coughs> he never once felt sorry for himself. He never once said, why me? He never got depressed. It was just, when I look back at that now, when I see a lot of, uh, when we go still go back up to the children just to visit kids, we can see that they're down and they're not feeling good. And Corey just was never like that. And that was his faith. That was his faith. He, he just knew that he knew. He said, this is just another bump in the road, Mom, and I'm going to beat this. Well, he was beating it. They finally got him clear in April. Now we're going to get a bone marrow transplant because that's the only way that his immune system can come back up and running again. <coughs> but two days, the day after his 16th birthday, we go in. He's complaining about his side. Decided to do another CT scan. T cell lymphoma came back in. It's all through his lungs now. He's got a big spot behind his heart. They just had him clear. <coughs> big crocodile tears came down his face. This was Gene. And I said, Cora, we, we did it once before. We can do it again. 
Don't give up hope. Let's do this, this prayer right now. He goes, Mom, let's. So we ended up praying in the uh, clinic, bone marrow clinic. By the time my husband arrived, we, Corey and I had ourselves together, but Dale didn't. And so we talked him through things, and then we got back into the hot unit, which is hematology, oncology, and transplant floor. We were there for seven months. They gave him a dose of chemo. Looked really good. He was eating over 3,500 3, calories I put down. I kept track. I kept track of everything he put in. I said, Corey, you're beating this. He goes, Mommy, I don't feel really good. But on the day of July 15th, I took him out for his walk. He could only do a lap. Deep down, I knew something wasn't right. That night, we're sitting there in the, his room. He's on his computer, and I'm on my computer. He goes, you know, Mom, if I die, I don't want you to be afraid for me, because I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. Out of the blue, he tells me this. I look at him, and I said, Corey, good for you. I said, that is awesome that you were even telling me this. Because how many 15, 16-year-old Tell their mom and dad that they're not afraid to die and they know they're going to go to heaven. Not many that I know of. And I, in the next breath he says to me, and if I do die, don't let it ruin your life. And I thank him for that, because that's what gives me peace. And then when he came to the funeral, when he came to the wake, and he had that beautiful, beautiful speech that Sam Murlock gave, he made this circle because when I emailed him, Forever Rain, it made a connection. And you, when you guys play that today, that was like my Super Bowl chant to come down here and talk to you. It just pumped me up with God's grace and mercy. But here's where the beauty of the ashes comes. Even though I don't have Corey, I have him here. I feel him. In my dreams. Two weeks after he died, I have to show this to you. Two weeks after he died, he appears in my dream. He's back to 160 pounds. He's buffed up again. Got his guns. Has his hair. I says, Corey, what are you doing? He goes, I'm doing Jesus work. Mm -hmm. Now, boys and girls, that's not my vocabulary. I don't go around saying I'm doing Jesus work. And then all of a sudden, he takes me to this humongous room. I can't see the ceiling, I can't see the sides, but I see all these 1950s and 60 cars, as far as I can see. And here's boys, Corey's age, working on the cars. Corey never worked on a car. He takes me over to his car, and this is what we do in our spare time, he says. I go, Corey, you never worked on your car. And he goes, well, that's why I'm learning now. And then I turn and look, and the boys that he was working with are all his age, and they give me one of these. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then as soon as I get that thought, I turn and look. Now I'm in a chapel. And I'm in an old chapel. I mean old, antique wood. Just massive, it had deep grooves in it. And I'm like, wow, where am I? And I turn and look. Well, here's a choir of boys, Corey's age, in jeans, wearing shirts, t shirt and they're praising God, singing at the top of their voices. And the room is huge. And I look up on the right-hand side, and here's Corey just singing in Sarga. I woke up from that dream, and I said, oh, thank you, Lord, for letting him visit. Shortly after that, two months later, I'm watching the bear game. Somebody pops in and I am. Have you had the thing of doing something in Corey's arm? One of my friends in the harbor. I didn't get much thought, you know, because I've been dealing with my grief and my husband's grief. Why don't we start a Corey's project? I start reaching out to people. Terry Comerford said, absolutely, what do we have to do? I said, well, let's do something. So we just start the ball rolling, we make a Facebook page, we get the word out that we want to give back to 
children's in honor, not just only in honor of Corey, but in honor of God and what he showed us through that whole course of battle because Corey never lost his faith. He never lost hope. He never had a pity party. That, to me, is God giving him the strength to do that battle. That's what that song means, forever reigns, no matter what. No matter what happens in your life, guess what you're running to? You run to Jesus. That's your victory. We can be free as Christians. No matter what happens, don't be afraid to die. You're going to get the victory and move up with your Heavenly Father. God, isn't that amazing? You should be happy and rejoicing. We shouldn't be sad. Sure, we miss people that we love. But, oh, you're going to see them again. And when you see them again, it's going to be for eternity. Eternity. Wrap your brain around that. How many have ever had a uh, pastor or a youth leader, they have a chalkboard or a whiteboard, and they make a line across it, all the way across, and they show you by a dot what your life is on earth, and the rest is eternity with your Heavenly Father? God just amazes me. And it amazes me now with Corey's project, we are continually giving back to children that are now in their battles with cancer. Six-month-old baby have cancer. 18-month-old baby having cancer. They're not hurt on long enough. What is with this cancer? We need to wipe it off the face of the earth. Don't understand it. But what I do understand is people reaching out, giving back, no matter what happens in your life, if you lose a loved one, if you had something traumatic happen in your life, instead of having a pity party for yourself in a corner, do something. Get up. Take a step of faith. Reach out. Give back. Not only are you going to be helping people, you're going to be helping yourself and the other loved ones. And that's what Corey's Project has done. Every time I give him $600 a month, debit cards and gas cards, so people can either have the financial help that they need, $2 million. I'm so glad I didn't have to pay only 1000 Thank God for insurance. But $2 million worth of procedures, chemo, drug, radiation, that end up the big bill is $2 million for seven months. But now we can help back with Children's Hospital with Corey's Project. And Corey's Project has taken a life of its own. Terry Cummer had been a very, very catalyst in that. Give Terry a round of applause. She helps me all the time. She drove Corey to and from school that last year and a half and really got acquainted with him. And Terry's quite the character, and so is Corey. Okay. So with that said, with Corey's project, taking a life of its own, people are constantly giving to me. As soon as I give money out through the mail and send it up to Paula Thompson up at Children's, I get donations coming back. God is in Corey's project. Then all of a sudden I get contacted by the Zion Running Club. They want to do a Corey's run in the Lake County Forest Preserve so that we get the funds for that, from that race for Corey's project. I had a mom contact me. Her daughter had to do something for their, their church, some type of project. Can we give out Easter baskets in Corey's name? We took up Easter baskets up at Children's. Then the high school contacts me, a high school that Corey didn't even go to. I graduated from, but they said, we heard you did be the match in Corey's honor a couple months after his death. Can you come and help us do be the match? That's a bone marrow registry. So that has taken on another life. It's just amazing what God has done without my son being here on earth, but yet, Corey is touching many, many lives still. And he's not here. And that's through God. And here's, we didn't know what Corey's project had such an effect on children's until I got this letter. This is Paula Thompson. She's a social worker that we worked with up at Children's. The Corey Project Fund has been wonderful to our hospital. 
This project has provided gas cards, debit cards, gift cards, and Christmas gifts to our patients and families for the last two years. I am an oncology social worker at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. I work with many families who are financially stressed due to the challenge of getting their child to the difficult chemotherapy, radiation, bone marrow transplants, and surgeries. We average 110 new children every year that develop cancer, immune failures, or blood disorders. My core workers have seen all new families and continue to work with our ongoing families. The average treatment plan is six months or longer. This means long hospital stays and frequent outpatient visits. Families come from all over Wisconsin and Northern Illinois to receive treatment at our hospital. Parents are therefore having difficulties keeping their jobs and their funding is stressed due to gas mileage, meals while at the hospital, child care for the other patient's siblings, and other necessary needs. The Cori Project has allowed these families to receive the additional support needed for these treatment courses. I am so excited when I heard from Cori's mother that they would be able to help our patients and their families. Cori's group brought Christmas present, over a thousand in the last two years, to our patients and families. They have adopted one of the families that were having personal financial issues. They gave them a box of donated items to help them get through the Christmas holidays. Corey's mother has very, very proactive, and without me asking, she sends out debit cards and gas cards every few months, even monthly. My hospital families use these debit cards for parent meals while at the hospital. It can be very expensive to eat while at our hospital, so these cards are always welcome. I recently helped a mom get home to Kenosha, Wisconsin, on a Wisconsin Coach Lines bus. She did not have the funds to get home and use the Corey Project debit cards to assist her in getting home to pick up supplies for her 14-month-old daughter who was still in our hospital. This funding has been a godsend for Children's Hospital of Wisconsin in personally helping our families with transportation to and from our treatment center. I also tell Corey's mother that she makes all the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin social workers look real good. Corey was a very special young man, and I thank him for the wonderful funding source. Every time I give a family a gas card, Christmas toy, gift card, or debit card, I think how Corey's life is touching so many patients and families. There are not many resources available to our families, and this project has helped them immensely. So anytime you face something that is keeping you down, I hope you remember God is right there with you in your battle, in your stress. He may not answer your prayer the way you want to because he's got a bigger plan. This was Corey's bigger plan. He had to die for this bigger plan. That's why I'm so at peace. And those of you that know me personal know why I'm at peace as well. Because on Corey's birthday, June 13th last year, I went out for my morning walk. And if you can, and if you want to meet with me personally, I have to show you personally what God showed me in the sky. If there was any doubt in your faith, when you see this, what he showed me, you will not have a doubt ever in your life again about your Heavenly Father, ever. And I thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Batts to stay around for just a few minutes. Again, they're going to probably mostly just depart from that door. Just to, you know, if you guys want to talk to her, if you want to shake a hand, uh, that would be fantastic word of encouragement. The thing that, uh, you know, what an awesome story, but that struck me most, the words that she said, in my plan, in Corey's plan, because I know even when he was sick, he was working at home on schoolwork. 
four weeks from tonight, the seniors are graduating. He would have been sitting right between bag and beard. He would have been sitting right between bag and beard. I, mean, I don't know that I would want to sit there, but that's where, that's where he would have been sitting. And uh, what, what she said was, you're, you're not promised tomorrow. None of us are promised tomorrow. And I think that's important. We heard last week during Spiritual Lunch this week just the importance of making certain that our lives are right and if you need to pray with somebody, if you need to talk to somebody, find one of your teachers. Find me. I would love to pray with you. I would love to talk to you. Uh, again, I appreciate you guys. Love you. Have a great weekend. See Dr. Betts on your way out. Have a good day.